All right. Good morning and welcome to today's Finance Committee meeting. My name is Julissa Ferreras Copeland. And I am the chair of the committee. I'd like to first acknowledge the members of the committee who have joined us. We have Council Minority Leader Matteo and Council Member Kalos. I'm sure members will be coming in and out throughout the hearing. Today the committee will be, he will, uh, be hearing two bills. The first, sponsored by Minority Leader Steve Matteo, is a pre-considered introduction that would amend the maximum allowable exemption under the Alternative Veterans Exemption. This, bill's, this bill complements proposed intro 1304A, which was heard by the committee in December. Together, these two bills represent the agreement reached by the Council and the Administration as part of the fiscal 2018 budget to expand the veterans' exemption and provide vital tax relief to those who bravely served our country. To provide some brief background, the veterans' exemption is different from other property tax exemptions in New York City. Unlike most exemptions, this exempt value of the property is still partially taxed. The property tax operates as a combination of two sub-rates, the school tax rate and the non-school tax rate. For the veteran's exemption, the property owner is still responsible for paying the school tax rate on the exempted value. Furthermore, the school rate varies depending on how much state and federal aid the city receives for its public schools. Cutbacks in the state and federal education funding can cause this tax relief provided by the exemption to shrink, as they have in the past. These two bills will fully exempt the veterans' benefit from all property taxes, while also lowering the maximum exempt value allowed. Together, these two actions will provide a well-deserved increase in tax relief to veteran homeowners and their families. I want to thank Minority Leader Mario for his leadership on this issue and his advocacy on behalf of our city's veterans. I also want to thank the administration for working with us to come to an agreement on these two priorities for the Council. The Department of Finance is with us today to testify on this important measure. The Council's the second bill on today's agenda, Introduction number 17, uh, sorry, 1176, sponsored by Council Member Ben Kalos, would mo codify the requirement that the Office of Management and Budget provide data to the Council online to the public in sortable, computer-readable formats. During my time as Finance Chair, I have made increasing budget accessibility and transparency one of my primary goals. I believe that New Yorkers should be able to access information about how the city spends their tax dollars in a clear, understandable way. An open government is a government that is more responsive and accountable to the public. I was glad that because of the Council's advocacy in the fiscal 2017's budget response, the administration has already put several budget-related items on the open data portal. This legislation is an important step in expanding the transparency of our city's budget. I want to thank Council Member Kalos for his advocacy and leadership in striving for government that is more open to all. Before we hear from the Department of Finance, I will turn it over to Minority Leader Mario, followed by Council Member Kalos to discuss their two bills. Minority Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your steadfast leadership and support of this bill. Um, we couldn't have done it without you, and I, I thank you. Um, this legislation will make it possible for us to provide New York City veterans with further savings on their property taxes. Uh, as everyone knows, this bill is a companion bill to intro 1304A, which I am a sponsor, um, which will expand the alternative veteran exemption to allow New York City to include the school district portion of the tax, as many other municipalities in the state already do. It was part of the agreement we made with the administration to include the alternative property tax exemption for veterans in the fiscal year 2018 budget. By capping the exemption, this bill will control the cost of the city and give us some fiscal certainty. But most importantly, it will double the exemption the average veteran household saves. That is real, that is significant, and is going to have a really deep impact on tens of thousands of veterans and their families. Because most veterans in New York City are seniors at or near retirement and living on a fixed income, 70% um, have served during a time of war and the majority are also homeowners. This money will be a lifeline and help them maintain and remain in our communities. I believe, as many of you do, that we need to do more to help all New York City families remain here, and we need a more fair and equitable property tax system. But until we can pass real property tax reform, we must pass legislation and other measures like this to help those in need and certainly deserve our help. So there's no better group, in my opinion, to start than with 
those who have sacrificed and served, and um, I'm very, very pleased that we were able to reach this agreement with the administration um, to help our veterans. So I want to thank you all for your support, my colleagues, and again, uh, especially uh, Chairwoman Ferreras Copeland. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Ferreras Copeland. I'm Ben Kalos. As always, you can tweet me at Ben Kalos. I'm looking at you, Beta NYC. Uh, it's been said that budgets are moral documents. Unfortunately, most of these moral documents are not made available to the public. New York City has thankfully been ahead of the curve in transparency, but even until last year, we did not have full transparency when it comes to our budget. I authored Introduction 1176 with Finance Chair Ferreras Copeland because we believe that every piece of our city's budget should be online in human and machine readable formats from the capital budget to Schedule C to the parts like the CAFR and appendices no one else has ever heard of. Uh, the legislation would align New York City data standards for its budget with federal standards in the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act of 2014, otherwise known as the Data Act, that led to the adoption of Extensible Business Reporting Language, XBRL, so that any software built for the federal budget could easily be used with the city's budget, like usaspending.gov. After several years of requesting these documents be made available, I was able to work with Chair Ferrer's Copeland, as well as Latanya McKenney, Dean Foulihan, and uh, others, and we were actually able to incorporate the ask into the council's budget response while, uh, while still working on the legislation. We then worked with the mayor's office to coordinate the introduction of the legislation, what the mayor's announcement to put more budget documents online, which you can now find on the open uh, uh, data portal uh, in formats that are useful to the public and also for policymakers. We need to codify and ensure that from here on after the public knows where each and every one of their pennies is being spent. Transparency restores trust in the system and no matter what happens in Washington or Albany, New Yorkers should know they can trust their city government. Thanks again to our finance chair, former committee counsel Rebecca Chase and former governmental operations analyst James Saputi, finance unit head John Russell and uh, to our finance chair for leading us through the successful budget cycles I look forward to today's hearing. Thank you. You may begin your opening testimony after my counsel swears you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Chairwoman Ferreras Copeland and members of the Committee of Finance. I am Michael Hyman, First Deputy Commissioner at the New York City Department of Finance. With me today is Samara Karasik, Assistant Commissioner of External Affairs. DOF supports pre-considered intro 6286, legislation that would establish that the maximum exemption allowable on qualifying residential real property under the alternative veterans tax exemption shall be the lesser of $48,000 or $48,000 multiplied by the latest class ratio for wartime veterans, $32,000 or $32,000 multiplied by the latest class ratio for the additional benefit provided combat veterans, and $160,000 or $160,000 multiplied by the latest class ratio for the additional benefit provided veterans with, services, with service connected disabilities. The new maximum exemptions established with this legislation would expand alternative veterans exemptions to the 41,100 veteran households who currently receive the benefit. DOF estimates that the benefit on FY17 recipients, the additional savings on this expanded exemption would be $595 annually. This is in addition to the existing average annual benefit of $545. If passed, this would bring the total alternative veterans average exemption to $1,140 for fiscal year 18. Due to the very short notice of this hearing, we are not able to fully review and comment on intro 1176, legislation that requires budget documents to be provided in certain formats. But we look forward to discussing it with you in the future. Thank you. This sounds like Monday after the budget. <laughs> and a hot, the hottest Monday uh, to date in 2017. Thank you so much. So um, I have a few questions. Um, one in particular is, can you tell us when, ve uh, when veterans can expect to see their enhanced savings on their tax bills? If you 
I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Um, when, can, when will veterans begin to see the enhanced the savings? Benefits. Well, if it's passed for FY18, we'll do a rebilling for the year, and they'll, they'll receive the full benefit. So that would either be, normally we do rebillings either for the second half of the year, or potentially for quarterly payers, it could be slightly earlier, but it would be on their quarterly statements they receive from us. So the next quarterly statement? They can Possibly. It's generally we do a lot of the rebuildings for the second half of the year. Uh, so it either would be the second half or if the programming allowed, we would do it for the second quarter statement. Okay. And just for the record, because there might be veterans watching, what does that mean in a date? So what do they? So likely it will go on the bills that we mail at the end of November around Thanksgiving that people have to pay by January 1st. And just to be clear for any of the veteran households that are listening, they will get the credit for the entire year no matter when in the year we give it. Great. And uh, will a qualifying veteran have to do anything to get the larger exemption or will the enhancement be automatic? No, it will be an automatic increase in the benefit. Excellent. And for a veteran who, let's say, is purchasing a home for the first time, happens to be a purchasing a home, let's say, today, what do they need to do to be able to qualify for the veteran's exemption? So they need to apply for it. Um, the deadline to apply for exemptions for fiscal 18 was on March 15, 2017. Um, so they will automatically get the more enhanced benefit if they qualify, but it won't go on until fiscal 19, which starts July 1st, 2018. So for someone who's purchasing a home now, they'll see it um, in FY19. As long as they apply by March 15th of 2018. By March 15th of 2018. Okay. And... Um, I wanted to talk about 1176. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. What kind of outreach efforts does DOF do to let veterans know about these exemptions? So we are very fortunate that right now, External Affairs, which has the Office of Outreach, is down the hall from the Department of Veterans Services. So we actually coordinate a lot on various outreach events and materials to make sure that people have the materials that they need. Um, we try and work with different veterans groups, some of whom we meet with regularly um, to try and keep them involved in what's going on with us and see how we can help them. We go to a lot of the veterans parades and events like that. We'll set up a table um, for the big one that takes place every summer. And then, you know, we're always open if there are groups out there. This is a public hearing. If you want us to do outreach, please let us know so that we can get in touch with you. Um, and you can contact us through the website by contacting 301 or through any of your local elected officials. They can get us directly. Great. And um, are veteran exemptions recipients also eligible for senior or disabled homeowner exemptions? And if so, do you do any work to inform veterans that they might be eligible for the other programs? Um, yes, and yes, with our outreach, we would explain all the different benefits that they can get. Um, that's also something that often will come up when we do a notice of property value outreach events, when we come out with the property assessments every year in January, and we do a lot of outreach in February. And so we do talk to people about that um, and the benefit application for veterans and for the senior and disabled homeowners exemptions are the same. So, um, and I know this is kind of... But when you're doing, for example, tax liens, I know that you do a lot of outreach during those programs. Would you also be talking about these potential savings that um, someone who may be on the verge of uh, being on the tax lien program, that they can also take advantage of all of these other exemptions? Yes, absolutely. One of the main things that we talk about at our outreach events is trying to help people understand how they can lower their tax bills in the future. Right. Um, can you provide a breakdown of the number of veterans receiving the exemption by borough? We certainly can give you that. Okay, good. And how, uh, how and when does a veteran, well, you asked that already. Does DOF require any renewals of the exemption at all at any point, or is it you apply once and you're automatically in? Well, you're in the program. We do monitor, you know, people's uh, lifestyle over time. You don't have to. Re you don't have to recertify every year. You know, we, we basically look for things like if if a household member has died, we will check and verify eligibility. So it's our responsibility to verify eligibility, but there's not a formal annual recertification process. So unlike Scree and Dree, where you're kind of oh, you always have to check back in, um, or or some of the other programs for certification, this is one once you've proven or, or certified that you don't have to recertify? We'll verify. Is that, that? Someone come and help them? <laughs> oh, there you are. Yes. Okay, there's no annual recertification process. We have that confirmed. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And what is the current homeownership rate among veterans in New York City? 
I, I don't I don't know. Um, I'm sorry. It's fine. You can, can we get that from you? We'll follow up with you. Yes. Great. And so and now 1176. Oh, they're not prepared for that. Okay. All right. Um, now we will hear from Matthew. I'm sure he has a couple of questions he would like to ask. Thank you, Madam Chair. But you did a very good job of getting all the answers that we need. No, that's great. We've been talking about it long enough, right, Madam Chair? Just a few uh, clarifications. So um, the $595 savings, that's the average? That's the overall average. And do you know how high it can go? How high? Yeah. Yeah, I think we gave to your council staff some distributional information as to everyone gets a benefit. There is, uh, you know, variation. So I think there is a max benefit amount. Do we have it here? Yeah, I just wanted to see. The maximum benefit is, this is additional to what the current benefit is, $1,157. I'm sorry, say that again? $1,157 okay. in additional benefit. And um, the 595 annually, that's per veteran, but if there are two veterans in a household, that's for the household? Um, the 595 is for the whole household. For the whole household. That's so right. So if there's one 595, if there's two veterans, it's still 595? Well, usually because of the way the homeowner's exemption works, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with a situation where there might be a few veterans that own a home together because it's people that are named on the deed that would qualify for so the exemption. So it's just per household then? So it's per household. And, you know, surviving spouse could also be included. Um, I do, I do want to mention with the 595 number, um, just for the record, that these are, these are estimates and they're based on fiscal 17 numbers, so we won't know for sure what the benefits are until we're in fiscal 18 and we sort of see how everything shakes out, and we're happy to fill you in once we have those numbers. But these are the best estimates that we have right now. Okay, uh, I appreciate that. So I guess what I was, what I was pointing at is a husband and wife who are both veterans who are on the deed, they would get the 595, right? I mean. That's right. Okay. Um, the 41,000 who currently receive the benefit, do you know how many are not receiving that can receive? Um, how many? So there's 41,000 veterans who are currently receiving the benefit. Do you know, <clears throat> excuse me, how many veterans uh, that are eligible but do not receive it? No, I, you know, one of the things that I think that the chair just asked is if we can follow up on the number of veteran homeowners in the city. I think the next step would then be to look at that and see if we can extrapolate how many of those owners do or don't have the benefit. So we'll look into that and get back to you and see what data we can find on that. But uh, we don't have that today. Okay. And I think that goes to the point of the conversation with the chair about outreach and that exactly. you know, the local members, obviously, we should have our own events and you know, make sure that all veterans know about this. Uh, because as we've been talking about this, I've been getting a lot of calls and emails from veterans who just who haven't even applied for the original exemption. And it's quite frankly, in, in my opinion, it's a lot um, that don't already get it. So um, I think we should all do a outreach within our districts and however you could do it. I, you know, I know we're going to do mailings and send them out and our newsletters and everything, but yeah, I and I mean, more, and especially, especially in your district where I, I know that there are a lot of veterans, if you're getting calls and you want us to come out and set up an event with those folks, we're happy to do that. Okay, and it's, so if they, if someone came, came to us and they filled out the application, they wouldn't get the benefit till July 1st of 18? Uh, July 1st, 18, that's right. Right, because it's March 15th, right? So the March 15th is the deadline. It's that's right. The March 15th is the deadline for every, yes. all the exemptions. Okay. All right, yeah, so we're going to have to, we should do a... Uh, outreach from now until uh, March to, to make sure we get everybody there. So um, a veteran who passes away but has um, a spouse, it, it, it's a, it, the, the exemption goes to the spouse? The exemption does go to a surviving spouse. It goes to the surviving spouse and then it, it ends with the spouse or if... The, if Maybe other relatives we can check. If the children are if they live at home with the children, does it go to them, or? I need to check with the people who administer the program. Yeah, it's the surviving spouse. Surviving spouse. Okay. 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 I think we've got everything. Okay. 
All right, we're good, thank you. Thank you, uh, Minority Leader. I have a quick question. I know that when you're going through your closing transactions, um, the city collects the transfer tax. Um, what is the engagement or, or where does the agency fall on at perhaps adding a question that says, are you a veteran? That's it. So then you'd have a more populated universe and you would know if this person applied or, or didn't. And I think that speaks to the number because the challenge is if those that are going to be able to take advantage of the savings are the ones that are already in the system. But if you don't know the universe, because honestly, you know, I've never, I don't remember in any of my closings that a veteran question is asked. So is that something that can be done um, and, and I'm just trying to find the link that it would really be through the transfer, because usually you really have no other involvement in the closing. I think that's a good idea, and in fact, we're looking at whether we should be doing that with all our exemption programs. The I point agree. Of, uh, I was going to start Santa, here, but that's where I was going. Like, welcome to New York City. Here are benefits you may be eligible for. Right. And, you know, check this box. So at least you can collect that data. Is that something that's doable? We'll go, we'll that go I don't have look to legislate. Into... Don't make me legislate it. No, no, no. <laughs> We're, we have already, as, as First Deputy Commissioner Hyman mentioned, like we are looking at our forms to try and understand how we can better reach people at exemptions, um, about their exemptions. I think one of the challenges that we have is, you know, if you've transferred properties in New York City, you've got a stack of paperwork that's like thus high, and most people don't really like look through everything that they sign. So, you know, something that we've been trying to think through is how we could have it somewhere where people might actually see it because you, you could do it in the first 10 pages. I think after the 10 pages is when you're like, whatever, where do I sign? <laughs> um, I, th I think it's a good idea and it's something we should pursue. Okay. Uh, Minority leader. I just, uh, one point I want to make for any veterans who are watching. One, obviously, you can call your local council member's office to get the link. Call 311. But do you have the exact link you could say for the record for the application uh, on the finance site? Um, give me a minute. I think I have a quick link to that. Would you? I but think we should give, say give it me, on the record. Yeah, give me a minute. Um, I'm going to search and see if I can find it for you now. Okay, thank you. Keep going. I'll get I'll get back to you over the course of the hearing. Don't stop. <laughs> okay. And uh, we've been joined by Council Member Cumbo. Um, and you can pop. What you can do is once you get the link, you can pass it to um, the Sergeant at Arms, and we'll say it publicly um, during the hearing because this portion is now over. Thank you so much for coming to testify. I'd like to say this was your fastest budget here. I mean, budget, I'm still in budget. Um, your fastest hearing, but I feel like we've had pretty, we've moved things through um, smoothly. So thank you very much for your partnership and for moving this along. This is very important for our city. Um, and we're looking forward to passing this uh, legislation. Thank you for coming to testify. Thank you. Okay. The next panel will be Kristen Rouse. You turn on your mic and begin your statement. Good morning. Uh, I'm, it's, uh, I'm pleased to be here uh, with you this morning. Um, and I'm surprised that I'm, I'm the only one on, on this panel. I'm feeling alone. So uh, <laughs> it is. It is. It's like, oh, is this is this it? Um, but so I, I do want to say thank you to um, to uh, Councilman Matteo uh, for his leadership on uh, on this tax exemption bill. Uh, and I mean, I know that this was a long, hard fight, and I I appreciate all that you did. And I and thank you to uh, the City Council and all City Council members who supported this. Um, this will make a tangible difference in the lives of so many veterans across the city. Um, this, is, this is a quality of life. This is a statement of value on, on, on what veterans mean to the city. And, I, and I'm grateful that, uh, that our city is beginning to, uh, to take tangible action to really recognize veterans in our service. And the fact that um, you know, our, our, our GI Bill of Rights promises veterans homeownership, the possibility of homeownership. And, uh, you know, and as you know, the rising costs in New York City of housing um, 
are making that increasing, increasingly less possible for veterans to, uh, to attain and, and maintain. And so, uh, so again, this is one step forward to make homeownership just that much more affordable and possible and sustainable uh, for New York City's veterans. Um, I, I do want to point out, however, that, um, you know, that the, the caps, uh, you know, they, they appear to be targeting the, you know, the most vulnerable, uh, you know, the, the, those most in need of this exemption and the relief, and, and that's an important thing. Um, and I realize that compromise is necessary um, to make things happen. Uh, but as an advocate, I, I do want to note that um, my concern that this is something that may not keep up with uh, the, the ballooning increases of, uh, of New York City school taxes that have made it so uh, such a strain on our city's veterans. Um, and, uh, and I also want to state that um, the, the five-year sunset of the tax exemption also appears, um, appears to be putting the burden on, on younger veterans who are struggling to buy these houses. Um, and because, uh, you know, the membership of my organization, the New York City Veterans Alliance, uh, often brings up to us that, uh, that home ownership for New York City veterans, uh, especially new ones returning, is functionally unattainable, um, you know, because the VA caps for home loans are, are not, doesn't, isn't keeping up with the market rates. So, um, so I'm concerned about the five-year sunset, and I'm concerned about the caps. And I do want to bring that up as, as an advocate for New York City's veterans. Um, and, uh, and I think that th that's, that's part of what's understood, but, but I do want that for the record. Um, and also on behalf of my membership constituency. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to um, separately encourage all city council members to, uh, to support um, introduction 1259, which prohibits discrimination against veterans and military members. Um, if, if uh, for those council members who've not yet signed on, uh, it would be a very meaningful and substantive uh, action to sign on and pass uh, 1259 uh, in order to, again, make tangible progress for New York City's veterans. And, uh, and again, on behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, the 200 members, uh, more than 200 members that I represent, and uh, as a resident of Brooklyn in Councilwoman Cumbo's district, uh, I would like to say thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk, comment and testify, and thank you for your work. Thank you. Um, I have a quick, I have two questions. One, well, one, thank you for coming to testify and for voicing um, your support and appreciation of this piece of legislation. Obviously, you know, if it were up to us, it would have no sunset and there'd be no caps. Um, but we have to negotiate and at the same time uh, take into consideration um, a lot of other variables, especially as the Finance Committee. We understand the impact that this has on our city as a whole. And I know that Minority Leader Mario has really been an incredible negotiator on this bill um, to make it as inclusive and to kind of move it along. But it's called negotiations for a reason. Everybody's got to give a little. Um, but my question is one, how have your veterans been, um, or how have your members been informed of the savings? Um, and have they found any process or any point of um, of this process uh, daunting or, or, you know, has it been readily accessible or do you have any issues in applying from the first perspective and also how do your veterans get informed about this potential savings? So we've, we've been discussing this with our membership since last summer. Uh, we, held a, we, we held a stakeholder meeting where we invited veterans who, who are homeowners, who are affected by, uh, by what was then you know, the, the, the school tax burden, uh, to, to come in and talk about it. And we also invited representatives from the Department of Finance to talk about the details um, of, of what, you know, what the current law was as of last summer. And so uh, what we found in that small group uh, was that there was a lot of confusion over specifications between, uh, between what, the state, uh, what the state exemptions are and what the city recognizes for those exemptions. And, uh, and I'm, I, I like to consider myself fairly well informed, but I found it confusing as well. Um, and you know, I understand that it's, you know, if it was easy to understand 
you know, taxation and all this, then we wouldn't need entire agencies dedicated to this, right? But but it's it was very difficult to understand. Uh, we also had veterans in the room who did not who did not know that they were eligible uh, for these tax exemptions, and so outreach is an important issue uh, on these exemptions to make sure that that veterans know it's know they're out there and and know what what they're able, you know, if there's if there's any kind of um, you know automatic. Uh, information that could be sent to them, which which speaks to Councilman Kalos's initiatives, um, you know, on opening data, on on doing as much as we can to uh, to, to open up city services and resources, um, you know, to be available online, to be you know you know it, like right. th you know this sort of thing. Just uh, there's there's a lot of opacity in in city services. Well, and I think this to, is one of welcome them. to government as a whole, right? Um, I don't think, I, we, we don't take the cake on that one. Yeah. Let's start all the way from the top. But my question is, how do we best reach veterans, right? Because we can reach out to groups, but usually groups have their own little memberships mm -hmm. and are often siloed, which is why we um, worked so hard with the administration to create an agency to be able. So in, where, where can we find veterans? Where can the DOF go to and say, hey, you know what? This is where we can begin to start imparting this outreach and this information. And what I found is that in, in the veterans community, which, which covers you know, everybody who's still alive, you know, right. till, uh, up to uh, much younger veterans who are coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan in their 20s. And so, so building up those online resources is very important for the younger generation, but reaching veterans where they're at, in the communities where they're at, uh, is very important. It's very much a person-to-person -person, uh, issue to, to make sure that the knowledge is there with, with all of the little organizations, whether it's the, you know, the Marine Corps League in Staten Island or, you know, or, or more individual individualized, you know, memberships at VFW or American Legion Halls. Um, my organization, the New York City Veterans Alliance, is striving to reach, to, to publicize more digitally and to reach as many people as we can that way and and sort of a ripple effect of, you know, emails, um, you know, having stuff posted on our website, you know, this kind of thing. And, and to have that, that mirrored and reinforced in, in government is is hugely important, and so to have to have the Department of Finance uh, tabling at community events all across the city is critical, and uh, and also not just to say okay we're we're the Department of Finance, but also say you know to to have more forward leaning maybe marketing you know to say are you getting all your benefits because uh, because veterans not, may not realize that this is something that they just aren't taking advantage of right. Great. But it's, it has to cover all age groups, though. Thank you. I know the minority leader had a statement. We've been joined by Council Member Van Bramer and Carnegie and, um, and Kumbal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know I, I, I just want to thank finance staff. I, I didn't get to a chance before, but um, Madam Chair talked about negotiating. We wouldn't get anywhere without Emery Ray and uh, Eric here. So I want to thank the three of you for your um, your work on all this, uh, we wouldn't get here without you, so thank you. Chris, I want to thank you for your leadership on behalf of veterans. Um, and Madam Chair, you know, is talking about the issues I want to talk about with you as well, and it shows we're on the same page here. Um, and you're right, we got, you know, you have to go to the groups. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we do that in Staten Island, and, and I've already started going to my veterans group. So the one thing I will ask of you is that you help out and keep doing what you're doing to make sure that every veteran gets a chance to uh, get this exemption. Um, because I am a little concerned, and I'm sure you heard from, from some of the calls and emails that I am receiving that there are veterans who are eligible that, that haven't received this yet. Um, so it's a little concerning to me. So I think we have to, we have to make sure we have a collective effort. So I want to thank you and, and, and work with you um, citywide to make sure that we reach every veteran possible. Absolutely. Um, in terms of the sunset, it's not ideal. You know, it's, but uh, as Madam Chair said, it's part of our negotiations and we have to give a little and, you know, um, some, some want to talk about a sunset every year to review. Uh, I'm glad that we negotiated that we don't have to do it every year, mm -hmm. that it will be to 2022. But on the flip side, it, it gets the council to review the caps as well. So it, it, it continues that discussion, which can also lead to maybe even a better exemption then, um, which is my hope. So um, the council will, will, will keep at it, but I, like I said, we, we could have got a sunset every year, which we didn't want. So part of the negotiation was to get it to 2022, so I'm proud of that. Um, and again, just thank you for your leadership, and let's just get the word out to as many veterans as possible. 
Great. And I also wanted to add that the sunset allows us an opportunity to take another stab at this. So if there's additional savings or, you know, we're able to grow the program, that's when we can do it, especially if the economy continues to grow, um, then we're able to provide more savings because, you know, our economy is a stronger economy. So these are opportunities that we can continue to engage and have this conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay? Understood. Thank you Thank so you. much for coming to testify today. Thank you. And I'm sure uh, Councilmember Cumbo is very excited to see her constituent here, too. <laughs> Um, is Councilmember Kalos? You want to call up the next panel? The next panel will be Mariana Alexander from the Citizens Budget Commission and Noel Hidalgo from Beta NYC. Okay. I did. I was on the floor. Um, you make you could begin your testimony. Good morning. I'm Mariana Alexander, research associate at the Citizens Budget Commission (CBC). The mission of CBC is to achieve constructive change in the finances and services of New York State and New York City government. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Introduction number 1176 would require the Office of Management and Budget to make relevant budgetary documents on one, the city's website, two, the NYC Open Data Web Portal, and three, via an open application program interface in both human-readable format and formats that permit automated processing, such as an Excel or CSV spreadsheet. In carrying out its mission, CBC depends heavily on the availability of up-to-date budgetary documents, including but not limited to the preliminary, executive, and adopted budgets and their supporting schedules, as well as the mayor's management reports. For budget watchdogs like us, the availability of data in open formats has significantly aided the speed and ease with which we can do our work. CBC supports the proposed legislation as it will ensure the continuing accessibility and usability of budget data, ultimately facilitating transparency and accountability in the budget process. We also offer two recommendations. The first is to add the preliminary and final mayor's management reports produced by the mayor's office of operations to the list of documents that should be made available on these platforms so as to facilitate the link between agency performance and budgeting. Second is to require that the office of management and budget make public a document that reports prior year fiscal, prior fiscal year actual spending in a similar a format similar to the supporting schedule, providing data by agency, unit of appropriation, and budget code. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Great, thank you. My name is Noel Hidalgo. I'm the executive director of Beta NYC. And for those of you who don't know Beta NYC, we're a civic hacking organization um, who has fought for the city's open data law since uh, 2009. Our membership is over 4,000 members, and we're a volunteer-led organization that believes that technology, data, and design can be used to improve people's lives. Uh, for, many, for many years, we have been working with the city budget data and have had many, many frustrations. We're members of the Transparency Working Group and have helped improve Checkbook 2.0, uh, but still find the city's budget data to be quite frustrating. We support 1176 of 2016, um, and the reasons why is that the current data that the city shares as much as, uh, let, me, let me make sure that I get this uh, right, um, as helpful as the new spreadsheets have been on the city's open data portal, they are still consistently frustrating to work with. Primarily, they are summary data, and it doesn't actually have the granularity that we would like to see. Um, the PDFs that have some of the details of the budget are horrendous, is the polite word to put it. Um, and um, it's very frustrating to actually look at what the city's budget looks like. Um, and so uh, most of the data that we've had access to is in summary formats, and that's actually not helpful for us to actually see what's going on within the city. Um, and so the key points of us supporting 1176 is that it increases budget transparency. Um, the big thing is that it adopts a data standard, a national data standard that helps us build applications that provide transparency at a federal level as well as a local level. Um, it, the potential to increase budget literacy with new applications that really make it simple so that way people everyday New Yorkers can have a better understanding of what's going on within their budget. Um, and then 
Lastly, it provides a interface, a programmable interface, for us to simply build new tools and applications. Um, so the only concerns that I have with 1176 um, is pretty much a concern that carries through all of the city's open data program, is making sure that when we find errors or inconsistencies, as uh, iQuant NY has pointed out a number of times within the city's budget data, that there is an iterative feedback loop to ensure that the city's budget data gets cleaned up and uh, becomes more accurate. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Councilmember Kalos. We've been joined by Council Members Miller and Gibson. So first to Citizens Budget Commission, thank you for reviewing the legislation on short notice and thank you for your recommendations, uh, hereby accepted. Uh, I, I would love to, are there any other additional documents you would see, see added or appendices or uh, CAFI or other agencies that have other similar budget type documents? I would just add that it would be helpful if the appendices to the mayor's management report would be included as well. I think the mayor's management report, we have gotten those appendices up. Okay. So right. take a double check, but if anything is missing, I, am, I promise you, uh, and, and somewhere Mindy Tarlow or her successor has just shuddered, uh, but uh, that, is, that is great. Uh, and Noel, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for asking others to join you via Twitter. Uh, and so. Just a, just a preliminary question. So you mentioned IQUANT, you mentioned correction. So you're telling me residents of the city of New York actually have already been going through the existing budget documents and just in the summaries, they've found mistakes. Yes. Uh, and, and so can you tell me just a little bit about why people are, how, how this works and how they were able to find this mistake or speak so, to a little bit about it? and. Uh, why it's important that we fix these mistakes? Sure. Um, I can't, uh, I will summarize briefly uh, um, Ben Wellington's iQuant NY posting. Um, last year's fiscal budget included a typo where the, um, uh, what is it, the, the services that provide consulary services, I believe, the NYPD's uh, kind of protection of diplomats um, in relationship to the UN um, had some numbers trans transposed. Um, and so it became the largest pool of money given to the NYPD. Uh, and it was, it, it was odd. It was, you know, it was a, as, as I recall, it was, it was a typo um, uh, and, and needed to be fixed. And so um, I believe it was fixed later on. Uh, because where the money was actually allocated was uh, uh, properly moved to. Um, but it provided insight in the sense that uh, the citizens are able to, uh, well, not just citizens, but residents and you know, people who come to New York were able to see exactly where the budget goes um, and make sure that there's accountability. That sounds right. Uh I guess another quick question, uh, can you speak a little bit about what you mean by granularity because I think some might say, well, the, it's already online on the open data portal and I guess for both, both you and CBC, so to the extent that just to give a straw person argument that it's already up on the open budget portal, why, on the open data portal, why do we need a bill to actually require more? Uh, what, what, are, what are you talking about in terms of granularity? Uh, well, so uh, my personal story is I live in North Brooklyn um, and I live on a street where a lot of trucks come down uh, that are kind of bypassing the construction around the BQE. Um, and we've had a couple children that have been hit by vehicles. And so understanding where North Brooklyn is spending its money on crossing guards um, and um, you know, is there adequate support for all of the dangerous intersections uh, that have been identified by the Department of Transportation and, and making sure that there's money for crossing guards is an important argument or an important issue that we've debated in the North Brooklyn Facebook group. And so having the ability to see very specifically where crossing guards are 
allocated across the city uh, to ensure that our children can be able to go to school safely is an important issue that I've seen come up in my community and that I want to make sure that there's equity um, for all of the other communities that have to deal with dangerous intersections. So that's why I want details. I want, I want to be able to see exactly what precincts and or what commands have this, you know, have budget allocation for crossing guards and making sure that those that have the dangerous intersections are protected. I think we find the supporting schedule to be sufficiently granular, but there's a bit of unclarity about which budget codes correspond to which policies and that generally like makes it difficult to understand those numbers. Which gets to that. And, and what you're describing as you look at the larger now online budget and perhaps an Excel sheet or something else, and then you'll say, oh, and then you'll search through a PDF that may or may not have a search function that works to then find the right page and then the right code and then try to figure out if the, figure out where the 19th precincts might be in the city of New York and then match that up to a dangerous intersection. Is that the current process? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so I guess uh, to Beta NYC, if you go to github.com slash Ben slash legislation slash blob slash master slash open space budget, uh, we've got a GitHub repo. We'd love to have specific language from you on granularity. Uh, and similarly to City Citizens Budget Commission, if you're able to submit uh, to this committee and, and to uh, policy of Ben Kalos, we'd be very interested in any specific language you would have. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez. Does any member have any additional questions? No? Thank you very much for coming to testify today. Um, and seeing no additional questions or anyone else coming to testify, we will now call this hearing adjourned.